even though horror books are a constant current in literature, they get sidelined a lot. Um, most bookshops don't have a really heavy horror section. It's not really their thing. Um, a lot of it is viewed as sort of genre trash. Page turners, pot boilers, skin crawlers. <laughs> I guess it is a passion of mine. I don't know why. When I was a kid, I couldn't watch horror movies or read scary books because they scared me too much. But as an adult, it is I read predominantly horror, which may seem strange. But, um, but like as with any genre, horror weaves in human life. The best horror writers are treading the line that a lot of magical realism treads as well. They're pulling the real world around us and some other thing that they've dredged up out of the back of their minds and they're meshing them in a way that's inextricable um, that you can't escape from and they're doing it in a way that constantly reminds you this other thing is there beside you um, it's tough to do um, and the really good ones are hard to get away from um, Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House is short and masterful and the best thing is when an author understands they don't need to drag it out <laughs> you know they just want to tailor it just enough to get you that's the best there are some authors like clive barker who who really seem to have pulled off a one-of-a-kind thing especially stuff like his books of blood and things like that he is a, he has a singular imagination for the horrific uh, it's very vivid and very arresting so he's, he's a tough one to match people up with for recommendations for further reading. Whereas like, you know, if you have somebody reading King, you can segue them into reading Peter Straub because, you know, you have that little in. It's like, well, he worked on the talisman. They worked on the talisman together. That was their baby. They made the talisman and the black house together. So there's a good chance that if you pick up Peter Straub's Floating Dragon or, you know, or one of his other books, you'd probably be pretty happy. Um, <laughs> if somebody has taken the plunge and started reading H.P. Lovecraft, he cultivated people, friends of his and fellow writers into extrapolating from his material. It's a lot easier to find good recommendations for people who have liked Lovecraft because Lovecraft has progeny. He has literary progeny. <laughs> he encouraged a lot of people um, to create their own versions of his stories and settings, the cosmic horror, the Cthulhu mythos. Um, but not only that, but he also wrote a great guide, the Guide to Supernatural Literature, which laid out in no uncertain terms what his influences were. So not only do you have people who directly descended from him in their literary lineage writing based on it, like Ramsey Campbell started out writing Lovecraftian fiction, like pure and simply read his first Arkham book, which was published when he was a teenager. And that's what he was doing. And he's fully aware of it. <laughs> and you are too, for sure, when you read those. Um, <laughs> and then later he matured and did his own style as well, but still tying that super creepy atmosphere into it. Um, so you have that, but you also have a roadmap to all of Lovecraft's contemporaries who are writing stuff he thought was really good and he scoured the market for good stuff, you can believe it, and people who preceded them. So, I mean, Lovecraft practically holds your hand and leads you to Arthur Machen, um, Algernon Blackwood, uh, M.R. James a little bit. Um, just, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic, so Lovecraft fans are very fruitful audience uh, <laughs> in the horror realm for coming up with recommendations. As you can see, this is our hardcover and softcover horror um, with anthologies, um, but this that's not it. There's actually a whole other section which is all the paperbacks with the crazy pulp art and the awesome 1980s ridiculous horror cover art. So we, we have a very very tasty horror section um, for you horror fans out there. You'll be surprised as well to find out how much Lovecraft a shop can stock when it really tries to. Stephen King of here is here, of course, because we're in Maine and he's a great storyteller. So I try to stock as many of his titles as I can, but 
it's almost impossible to have them all, all the time. A lot of authors classically in literature wrote um, ghost stories and spooky stories intermixed with the regular stories. Um, and I don't think most people realize that, you know, Charles Dickens, we all know A Christmas Carol, but that was, you know, that's ostensibly a ghost story. So there's a lot of great literature that's that would be relegated to the horror section, which most people dismiss. Um, whereas I get really excited when I find somebody's written a horror story. <laughs> so um, it's great stuff. Anything you can read that takes you to a different place and totally transposes you into that environment and can make you think differently. Like even when you put down the book, you find yourself, <laughs> there's still that layer of unrealness around you um that's somebody's done a good job writing a horror book when that happens and there's a lot of different types of horror i know i'm not big into really heavy gory horror i prefer the classic ghost story with a spooky environment um, ramsey campbell is one of my favorite authors because he just dredges up that atmosphere so well you have the cosmic horror you know where you are this tiny thing in the cosmos and it really doesn't care about you. You have monsters, uh, you know, you have the typical vampires and werewolves, but you've got, there's so many other monsters out there just waiting in the pages of those books. <laughs> um, but, you know, really what ties it all together is, you know, if somebody's telling a story and it's pulling you in and you're with those people, that's when the horror is real. So, and it's a great way to escape. <laughs> There's so many crummy things going on. Anyways, you know, it's nice to distract yourself with something utterly spooky that you know you can put down later and set aside and walk away from. I mean, I think the most uncommon thing about the horror section of the Green Hand is it exists. Um, we have a horror section and it's heavily cultivated. I'm constantly adding stuff to it. Um, I hunt stuff down to make sure I have it in the store. Stuff like Lovecraft, M.R. James, uh, Shirley Jackson, um, A. Merritt. Uh, like, there's stuff that you don't usually stumble across. Or if you stumble across it, you're very lucky. And I try to break that <laughs> pattern. I try to, I'm trying to like grow a little Petri dish of all the best horror authors so that there's always something to pick from. And we're trying for good horror. Like there's fun horror too. There's plenty of awesomely trashy 80s horror paperbacks kicking around. We've got a lot of those too. Um, movie tie-ins, you name it. But there's a backbone to it all. Um, that's really, really great horror literature because there's a lot of it out there and it gets neglected. It goes out of print. Uh, the horror market is incredibly fickle and it's a niche audience. So, you know, stuff doesn't get printed in quantity unless you're Stephen King. Um, some of it hasn't been in print for, you know, over a century. So, you know, you have to hunt for stuff. So I try to do some of the hunting for the horror audience and bring it all into one place. So it's living as one big, happy, scary family. <laughs> <laughs>